PH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and we're talking about Assassin's Creed here. They just dropped the set recently. You might not be aware of it. Cards that are, of course, legal in the Commander format and we'll see play in the Commander format. I already talked about the 99 cards in a video. Some pretty great ones there. You might want to check that out. Now I'm talking about the Commanders, and we got a few really neat Commanders here as well. So let's get to it. I'm going to start out with a bang here. This is a commander that I'm sure is getting some buzz. The Capitoline Triad. 10 mana. And of course, as I said in the last video, and I have been saying all the time lately, whenever you see a really expensive card like that, typically there is going to be a cost reduction, unless maybe it's an Eldrazi. But... We're going to see a cost reduction here for sure, right? It is a legendary creature, God Artificer 7-7. And of course, when you're looking at this card, it might seem a little weird. It is a colorless card, just like an Eldrazi, right? It's not an artifact. It is just a colorless card. So of course, because it's a legendary creature, it can be your commander. So if you're looking to make a colorless commander deck, this will be an option for you. It's also a god, I will point that out as well, and as I say all the time, if you have a commander that is a god that doesn't already have indestructible, Tyrite Sanctum is an auto-include because, of course, you can skip over the first step and go right to the second step, and being as you have a commander here that's pretty expensive and has a very powerful ability, that's going to be an absolute slam dunk in this deck. So what is it doing? This spell costs one less to cast for each historic card in your graveyard. Shocking, right? So if we can get some artifacts and other stuff into your... Um, of course, you're in a colorless deck, and I'm going to talk about this card as if it was a commander, right? With all these guys, I'm going to lean more towards what if we're building around it. The artifact part, of course, is going to be the easiest here. Wayfarer's Bauble, right? Burnished Heart, you know, stuff like that. You're going to want those artifacts that are sacrificing to get you lands, ideally, and then go to the graveyard because we're going to want stuff in our graveyard. You can do a little bit of a discard theme if you just want to chuck stuff in your graveyard to make your commander cost less. This ability, though, really is going to lean towards, I, I think, probably the discard looting theme. Exile any number of historic cards from your graveyard with total mana value 30 or greater. You get an emblem with creatures you control have base power <laughs> toughness 9-9. Nine, nine. Oh, wow. That's funny. Um, I will say you could put this in the 99 of a lot of decks. I'm sure a lot of colorless decks could could easily use this. I mean, I guess you could put this in the 99 of any deck that's playing a heavy historic theme. It, it could be used as a finisher. I'm sure a lot of people will do that. I mean, even just I'm doing Saga Tribal or something. Exile a bunch from my graveyard and now all my creatures are nine nines, right? And it is an emblem, so it's not going anywhere. Certainly you could do that. Um, it's obviously going to be a one-time thing because doing it more than once, I don't think is going to make a difference. This is probably sort of like a game ending scenario, uh, sort of a win con for a lot of decks out there. So might slot it in the 99 of decks as sort of an alt win con for your deck. As a commander though, obviously, you know, this is one of those commanders where there's a lot of setup, but obviously the payoff is worth it, right? I'm going to sit there doing a bunch of stuff for the first like five or six turns. I'm going to be looting. I'm going to be, you know, cracking those Wayfarer's baubles and stuff, filling my graveyard with artifacts. Obviously, if this is your commander, I think it's going to be almost entirely artifacts. You're not going to find a lot of legendary. I mean, obviously, if, if it's legendary, it's probably also going to be an artifact. So it, it's likely going to be mostly artifacts that you're dealing with here. I don't think there's any colorless sagas, so you're probably not going to have any of those in the deck. How are you going to close out the game, though, right? You need creatures in play. Certainly, you could. I'll throw out one of my favorite cards of late. I've won a couple of games with this card, Canoptech Scarab Swarm, slam dunk in this deck. When it enters the battlefield, you exile target player's graveyard for each artifact land card. Exile this way, create a 1-1 one -one colorless artifact insect creature, Tome of Flying. So this is a way to put a whole bunch of flying creatures into play that, of course, with your Commander's Emblem are going to be 9-9s, nine but you can use this on yourself. I've done it a couple of times where I've got a ton of lands and artifacts in my graveyard, and I don't care if they get exiled. I just want to make a bunch of insects to close out the game, and in this deck, you can do that as well. I mean, you already have to exile 30 mana value to get the Emblem, but whatever you got left can work with your Canoptech Swarm, so that could be a great way to close out the game in this deck. Pretty interesting commander, for sure. A little less flashy, our Baz Mir, and again, as I already had warned in the first video, 
Things are going to get a little out of hand with the pronunciations here. I'm sure I'm going to be hearing it in the comments. I always do about my pronunciations, but particularly here, we got some some names. I, there's one coming up that I'm just really not looking forward to. I don't even know if I'm going to attempt it, but certainly I'm going to be getting some wrong here. Absolutely, without a doubt. So red and a white human assassin, Tutu, an obviously massive assassin tribal theme here. If you want to do an assassin tribal deck, probably in just about any color, you can now do it because of the commanders from this set. So whenever Arbaz, Mir, or another non-token historic permanent, and again with a historic theme, huge in this set, enters the battlefield under your control, Arbaz, Mir deals one damage to each opponent and you gain one life. So not a super overwhelming ability. I do like the deal damage to an opponent, which means we can do the non-combat damage theme here. There's a lot of support there. I'll just throw out Chandra's Spitfire as I do all the time. Your Chandra's Spitfire gets plus three plus O oh every time an opponent gets dealt non-combat damage and your commander here is going to deal one damage to each opponent. That's three triggers that turns your um, Chandra's Spitfire, it gives it a plus nine just from one trigger from your commander. So that's a, a pretty great way to, to be knocking people out in a deck like this. You also got the life gains. So you can build around that as well. I would absolutely put a Well Lost Dreams in this deck. As I say all the time, if your deck is gaining life regularly at all, Well Lost Dreams is likely going to be your best draw option. It's also historic. So I play my Well Lost Dreams and I gain a life and I can immediately pay one mana and draw a card, right? So it's going to already replace itself. Pretty good fit in the deck, I think. It doesn't look like a lot, but I think it's pretty neat. And obviously it's non-token. So all the people thinking, hey, I'll Dockside Extortionist. Nah, that's not going to work, unfortunately. You're going to have to do non-token historic permanence here. But it, I liked how open-ended it is. I can do Boros Sagas here. I can do Artifacts. I can do Legendary Tribal. This, again, a lot of these probably commanders are, as I will mention, will likely also fit in the 99 of a lot of decks. This could easily fit in the 99 of a Boros equipment deck because of course equipment are historic they're going to be entering the battlefield and you're going to be getting that damage and the life gain so also there as well not a bad commander i think evor wolf kissed three red white green human assassin warrior seven six trample and haste that's scary creature i purposely grabbed this alternate art here this is the um showcase art whatever you want to call it from the set pretty sweet i like this one i don't know so maybe not for everybody, but this is a pretty sweet looking card, I gotta say. Whenever Eivor Wolfkiss deals combat damage to a player, you mill that many cards. You may put a Saga, a card, and or land card from under the battlefield. Of course, we can do both of those. We can do either or. This, to me, is one of those commanders that you very much could build around. That's kind of why I like it, is you could very much build around this, um, but also... You could use it as a commander for, say I already had a Naya land theme deck, and I'll just throw an idea out there that I, I mean, an idea I've thrown out before many times. My land tax seismic assault, I fill my hand with lands and then discard them to my seismic assault. You know, Creeping Renaissance is great for getting all those lands back at you, all of that kind of stuff. That deck idea was a Naya deck idea, so if you really liked that deck idea, this could be, again, that's a method two deck, which means I'm not entirely building around my commander. I just want a commander that fits the theme of what I'm doing. This could be a commander that very much fits that theme because it's just good value. I'm getting lands out of my graveyard to put my hand so that I can discard. And, and you know, you're doing a whole lot of that. Anyway, I'm just throwing that out as an idea with this commander because this is a commander that you could very much build around, but also I think makes a really good method two commander as well, where you're already doing a theme in either sagas or lands where this could actually fit fit. Xiao Yun, probably? One blue, red, human assassin, 3-3. Three, three. I don't know how many commanders from this set are not assassins. <laughs> Pretty much all of them are, I think, obviously. So, as long as it's your turn, Xiao Yun is flying in first strike. Not bad. So we already have a 3-3 three, three flying first strike creature for three mana. Pretty good. voltron -y kind of theme, maybe, maybe not. That's kind of why I like this commander, because it's actually not really sure where what direction you're going to go here. Tap two un untapped artifacts you control. Xiao Yun deals one damage to each opponent. So again, with that one damage to each opponent, and again, we're in the non-combat damage theme, so everything I said about the other guy applies here as well. I like the whole tapping untapped artifacts thing. There's a lot you can do there. It's very open-ended. I like open-ended commanders like this. Again, it's not flashy, but there's a lot you can do here. 
here. I think this would make a good Voltron strategy. The reason why is, and I believe I just talked about this in my last Magic Rules video, it's very easy to tap down your equipment, right? Of course, if you're in a Voltron strategy, you're going to be playing equipment a lot. Put a bunch of stuff on my commander, like that new equipment that gives your commander plus 10 plus 0. And I think it gives vigilance as well. So now my commander is flying first strike vigilance 13-3. So that's two hit kill. And all those equipment you're putting on your commander or you just have lying around, if you don't, if you can't pay to equip them, you tap them down to deal damage to each of your opponents, right? You can tap equipment while they're attached to your creature and they won't do anything. It doesn't change anything in that scenario. Your commander can very easily be attacking with six equipment attached to it that are all tapped. It doesn't change anything in that equation. So that, that theme I really like here, pretty neat. Let's talk about Sinu Keen-Eyed Protector. This is a really, really interesting commander. It's, it's again, not super flashy, but I had to talk about it. One and a white, Bird Scout 2-1, Flying Vigilance. Tap, Exile, Sanu, Keen-Eyed Protector. You gain two life and you scry two, so you're going to exile your own commander. Pretty funny. However, when a legendary creature you control attacks and isn't blocked if Sanu is exiled, put on the battlefield attacking. So we have some very unique wording here. Um, I mean, this card obviously is very unique in general. The unique wording here that we really don't see much is... When a legendary creature, of course, you're going to want other legendary creatures here. A legendary creature you control attacks and isn't blocked. That wording they used to use a lot. They don't really use anymore. So because of the phrasing, we're already past the declare blocker step, which means that is when you're going to return this to play. And of course, it's not tapped and attacking. It's just attacking. I, I don't think I've ever seen that wording on a card before. It comes into play untapped because of course it has vigilance and it's attacking. And because we're past the declare blocker step, it's impossible for your opponents to block it. So this is essentially unblockable when you do that, which is important as well. So you're always going to be getting in for damage with this guy as long as you have another legendary creature that you are attacking and isn't blocked. So... What are you going to do there? You could very easily do bird tribal here, I think. There's a lot of support in white for that. You're going to want legendary birds, though. How many of those are there? I know there's a few legendary white birds. Um, you could just do flying tribal as well in white. That is definitely, and again, how many legendary flying cards do we have? There's probably a few. Gaining life and scrying two is always good, but the gain life means I'm going to throw well lost dreams in here again because it's going to be my best card draw option. Scrying two is always good. And... Outside of that, you know, you kind of just do what you want. You could do just a legendary tribal deck here as well, obviously. I mean, it's not big and splashy. It's just a neat card. It is, again, a card that probably could go in the 99 of a lot of decks. I mean, if you have a commander in white that's just attacking a lot, this is just free value, right? Because I'm going to exile this guy before combat, gain two life and scry, and then I'll attack with my commander. And, you know, again, if I'm planning on my commander not getting blocked, this guy just comes back in, does two damage, and then I get to use the ability. And I just keep using that ability over and over again, right? So it could be just really great value in a, in a commander deck where you're attacking a lot with your commander. All right, moving on. Surter Fiery Jotun. Three red, red, giant god warrior, five, five. I will say, as far as the whole universes beyond thing, I think for the most part, this fits pretty good. I mean, we got assassins and we got a lot of sort of historic stuff, mythological stuff, I would say, um, that I think very easily fits in the, in the uh, game of magic, the ethos and all that. I don't think we've seen anything here that seems really weird and out of place. So I will say that. I mean, this card, if you didn't know it was from Assassin's Creed, looks like a magic card, right? So I'll just say that that can be relevant for some people. Three red, red, Giant God Warrior 5-5, five, five. so again, with the God that doesn't have Indestructible, and especially in a mono red deck, Tyrant Sanctum's got to go in here, has Trample whenever you cast a Historic Spell. Surter, Fiery Jodan deals three damage to any target, that's it. Pretty simple, um, but also pretty good. And again, in the non-combat damage theme, I, I haven't planned this at all. So now, if I have my Chandra's Incinerator, I can shoot my opponent. Instead of hitting the creature, you know, my opponent has a Thrasio, so I want to get off the table. Instead, I'll just shoot them in the face, and then my Chandra's Incinerator will take care of that Thrasio. So it's just great value there. So a slam dunk in this deck, if you are putting this deck together. Again, historic means all those things, so you can 
go in any of those themes, or you can do all of them. That would be interesting as well. I just throw some great artifacts. I mean, artifacts is the easy one. Some just really neat sagas that I like in red that I'll play and some really neat legendary creatures or legendary anything, I guess. Legendary enchantments as well will work. Planeswalkers even will work because those are legendary. I could just throw all the good stuff in, in a mono red deck that I want to play. And every time I play them, I get three damage to any target. Pretty good. But again, another card that probably is going to likely go in the 99 of a lot of decks, particularly those is it artifact decks are going to love this. And if you have a Joyra deck where you're kind of just going off with the uh, casting zero mana artifacts, this looks like a win con in that deck, right? So probably going to go in the 99 of decks as well. All right, here we go. Ratten Hanakitan. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know I, I get, unless you've played the game, I, you would have no idea how to pronounce that. I don't know. Anyway, white, blue, black, human assassin, 3-3. Three, three. As long as this guy hasn't dealt damage yet, it has hexproof and can't be blocked. Pretty great. I, and, you know, obviously if I just put hexproof on this guy, that's ideal. But outside of that, it's kind of nice to have that because, I mean, for two reasons. One... You're going to play your commander and it's, I mean, it's not a guarantee that it's not going to die, obviously, because board wipes exist, but it's pretty good that I can now wait until my next turn and not, not have to worry about targeted removal, right? And also because it can't be blocked, I also will get the very obvious deal damage trigger, almost a guarantee there as well, right? So n nice insurance policy there, that ability. And because it's as long as it hasn't dealt damage yet, meaning entirely in this game, blinking might be an option here for you because of course, if you blink your commander, I mean, you could just throw a Conjurer's Closet in this deck. I attack with my commander, I get the damage trigger, and then on my end step, I blink it. So when it comes back, it's a brand new card, essentially, at least that's the way the game sees it. And it now has hexproof and can't be blocked again. So I can just repeat the process. So you might want to think about doing that in this deck. However, when this guy deals combat damage to a player, Create a 1-1 one, one black assassin creature token with menace. When you do, return target equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield, then attach it to that token. So weird. Now, again, very interesting. I believe there are some equipment. I think there are some that sacrifice themselves. I, if I'm not mistaken, that'll work here. Again, though, I think you want to be doing the looting thing, which of course in Esper Colors is super easy. I can just, you know, draw and discard and I'll just chuck... Whatever, you know, I'll chuck that huge, nasty, uh, you know, whatever that equipment is I talked about in the last video into my graveyard. And again, that one actually, because it says equipped to legendary, uh, as I talked about in that video, you can get around that by having an ability like this that just says attach it to that token. So it doesn't actually equip to a legendary creature, but if you have an ability that sort of works around that, then it will work, right? So I'm going to create a 1-1 black assassin creature token with Menace. I've chucked that into the graveyard, and now it's going to attach to the token, which is going to be a 10-1. Pretty good, right? And Menace, not too shabby. So I think this is going to be a pretty popular one. If I had to guess, I'm not looking forward to having people try and pronounce the name. I mean, maybe people know the correct way. So if you do, maybe you want to build this deck. Really neat commander, though, I think. This is probably one of the more interesting ones from the set for sure. And I think it's going to, it might actually be pretty popular. Shay Cormick, and I got to talk about this commander because I think this likely will be the most hated commander from this set, I think. I'm already sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm at the point already where I'm like, if I see this in the command zone, I'm like, oh. Oh boy, here we go. So white and a black human knight rogue one one. And I will say this is a pretty interesting commander, but this ability, pay one. Permanence your opponent's control, lose hexproof, indestructible protection shroud and ward until end of turn. Holy, really? So because this is so easy to do, and because of course you can do it whenever you want, it almost makes it so that any of the protection you have, in, and I know a lot of people will like when they see this, they're like, oh great, I'm so sick and tired of my opponent blacksmith skilling, and I'm sick of the ward on my opponent's Voja, you know, stuff like that. So they're going to think this is great, but... Yeah, I don't know. This could be a little cringy, right? This could be one of those commanders that, okay, so all the stuff I have in my deck, the, the Lightning Greaves, the Blacksmith skill, because of course every deck should be playing protection. You you really, really need to. All that stuff is now useless, right? That my commander's plate, that's useless. All that stuff now, if I'm playing against this commander, and that's why people might find this card annoying because every deck likely is going to have stuff that is giving Hexproof, Indestructible Protection, Shroud, or Ward, and maybe even it already has it on it. Your commander might be built in with the Ward, for example. And this guy's just going to shut it off so easily. I think that's going to annoy a lot of people. I know it probably will annoy me because I usually put a lot of protection in my deck. 
but a lot of people are probably annoyed by the people that are constantly doing the protection thing. And so, I don't know, wherever you come out with the end of the argument, maybe you like this commander, maybe you hate it. What else is it doing though? Whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes the target of a spell or ability you control, put a bounty counter on that creature. And as uh, we have discussed so much recently <laughs> as it happens, um, I mean, the bounty counter thing, obviously that fits in a lot of decks already. If you're doing a Mathis deck, uh, I think this is an auto include, right? Because it just references bounty counters. There's a deck that you're going to want to put it in. Um, I think that's the only one that it fits in the 99. Obviously that first ability is so fantastic that again, you, you could just put this in the 99 of any deck and it's going to be fantastic because just like a shadow spear shutting off your opponents indestructible and hexproof and stuff is, is super valuable in a commander game, right? Just for that first ability, you might want to just chuck this in the 99 of any deck. And then on top of that, whenever a creature an opponent controls becomes a target of spell or ability you control, that's something you're going to be doing a lot in any commander game already as well. But obviously you can build around it as well. And whenever a creature with a bounty counter on it dies, put two counters on Shea Cormac. So he's going to get pretty big. I mean, that ability is not super great, honestly. And if I was building this card as a, a commander, you're, you're probably going to want to put something else in here that gives you more of a benefit from the bounty counters. Like that new mana rock I think we got in Outlaws Thunder, Thunder Junction, you're definitely going to want to put in here. Because the benefit of I just put two counters on my commander is not super great. I mean... It's, it's just going to make you a big vanilla commander. That first ability is the big one. That first ability is bonkers, in my opinion. And again, that's why this commander can very much sort of feel like a, a method two commander, where because I have that really, really helpful ability in the command zone of shutting off my opponent's indestructible shroud, blah, 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 I can use this as the commander for a method two deck where I want to be doing some theme where I'm targeting my opponents a lot, right? So probably a great commander there and probably a great card in the 99 of a lot of decks as well. All right, I think the probably most interesting commander from this set is Socrates, Athenian teacher. And we got a lot of historic figures here. So Socrates is, and I think Socrates might be my favorite old philosopher. I don't know, I like Plato as well, but Socrates is great. One white and a blue human advisor, 04 with Defender. Of course, he's not attacking. That would make no sense. I mean, the flavor here is great in this set. I'll just say, even though I don't know anything about Assassin's Creed really at all, other than the obvious stuff, the, the flavor from this set, I think they did a pretty good job and they did a pretty damn good job with the flavor on this card as well. Socrates Athenian Teacher has Hexproof as long as it's untapped. So again, that conditional Hexproof. Tap until end of turn, target creature gains. If this creature would deal combat damage to a player, prevent that damage, this creature's controller... And that player draw half that many cards rounded down. And man, I did, another thing that they've revisited, which I didn't think I would ever see again. We've seen the Shroud. They've been revisiting that. They've been revisiting the attacking and, and isn't blocked, which I didn't think I'd ever see that again. And now we're seeing the rounded down, half that many rounded down, which I, again, that's something they kind of got away from, but now we're back to it. So just a really neat ability here and how are you going to build around it, right? So getting a little bit of explanation of how it works, if this creature would deal combat damage to a player, and the wording might be confusing here, the player, of course, that person who is going to get dealt damage is, is a key of component here because you're going to prevent the damage. So this is obviously going to be preventing damage. Then this creature's controller and that player. So in other words, the creature who was attacking. So you could just do this with two opponents. One opponent is attacking another opponent. You're going to prevent the damage from that creature and the player who has been prevented damage, the, the player that would have been dealt damage, those two players are going to draw cards. So you could obviously very much just build a huggy theme here. You could, I mean, man, this probably goes in the 99 of a queen deck, right? Because you likely are doing that. You could do a huggy theme. You could do, I'm trying to hurt my opponents, the false hug sort of scenario. I have an Ebony Owl Netsuke in this deck and I am punishing my opponents for having a big hand size. I would say that white blue is not the best colors for that, but you could do it. Um, again, anyone playing a queen deck, you might be doing something similar to what you're doing here. Obviously, you can use the ability on yourself, preventing the damage to you. I think that's likely the, the best scenario where someone attacks you, but then you have to have people attack you, right? So someone attacks you, you're going to prevent the damage and also draw cards, but that person also draws cards, right? So, you know, you got to play around the, the idea of your opponents drawing cards here. 
because that is a, a likely a guaranteed scenario that's going to happen. Too bad Tall Breacher's been in the format, right? That would be a slam dunk here. You do have Alms Collector as an option. That would be a, a great option in this deck because, of course, your uh, commander's ability gets a lot better that way. Um, it is half that many cards, though. So, I mean, I guess if you're, even if it's a six power creature, you and that person are going to each draw three cards, right? This creature's controller and that player each draw half that many cards rounded down. So yeah, the colors here make things interesting. Getting a payoff for having your opponents draw cards is, I mean, getting a payoff for you drawing cards is the easy part. Getting a payoff for your opponents drawing cards might be the tough one. However, again, you could do the huggy theme here where I don't I don't have a punishing effect for my opponents, maybe other than the alms collector. I'm just enticing my opponents because I want to draw cards, right? So if my opponent's got a giant creature, I just make a deal with them and say, hey, attack me with that 6-6 six, six, and we both get to draw three cards. I'll prevent the damage, but we both get to draw three cards. They'll probably take that deal all day, right? And so it could be a really easy way for you to just get lots of draw. And then you could just do the, you know, I draw my second card each turn. And, uh, you know, whenever you draw a card, this thing happens. It could be a fantastic fit for one of my favorite cards that I've tried to unlock in the commander format, Archmage Ascension. Pretty good fit there, right? So um, obviously because your commander's uh, tapping and also has Hexproof as long as it's untapped, untappers are going to be an absolute must in this deck, right? Thousand Year Elixir, obviously. Fate Stitcher, all that kind of stuff as well. You're definitely going to want to put in here. It's a really interesting build around, I think, for sure. There you go. Commanders from Assassin's Creed. We got some interesting ones for sure. I don't think we got anything too scary here. Nothing too busted. Nothing like that. No, nope. I think we just got a bunch of really interesting commanders. If you're grabbing any of these and building decks around them, let me know in the comments below. Maybe you're just a big Assassin's Creed fan and some of these characters are your favorites or maybe you're a big philosophy fan and socrates is one of your favorite philosophers all time and you want to build a, a socrates deck you guys let me know regardless of the case in the comments below that is it for today though and thanks for tuning in mm -hmm.